conquering forms in view. So I'm going to try to keep this moderately entertaining, despite the fact that forms are probably one of the most boring things in web development. Um, but we actually are all doing this all the time, right? I mean, show of hands, how many of you spend at least some significant portion of your life writing forms? Yeah, okay. Literally everybody. Literally everybody. Um, nothing really happens without a form. You're not buying a plane ticket. You're not checking out from Amazon. Everything happens with forms. So this is me, Justin Schrader, as he said. Um, I'm going to be talking to you mostly about FormKit, which is an open source library um, that I wrote. I'm a co-founder of a company called Braid, small uh, agency, and there's a few other open source projects um, that I've created. One's called Arrow, um, Auto Animate, and View Formulate. Um, has anybody in this room used View Formulate for View 2? No, a couple of you. Okay, it's sort of the spiritual predecessor to to FormKit. But today, I want to talk a little bit more than just about FormKit. Um, and actually, this is this, I've given lots of talks on FormKit. But this is the first one where I want to explain how it really solves the fundamental problem with forms. So first, I want to explain why forms are hard, then some theoretical solutions uh, for forms, and then how FormKit's implementation tries to solve that. There's this misconception, though, that forms aren't hard. And I know that most of you in your heart know this, but it's actually a popular thing out on the web. Like, all we need to do is just use some form data, maybe some native validation, and that's going to solve the form problem for us. Um, and fundamentally, this is true, right? Form data does work, and you should do this if you have a very simple form. <laughs> a very simple form. You're talking about a couple of inputs. Please, just use form data and native validation. You don't need form kit, you don't need anything else. There's another one uh, misconception that that frameworks have solved the problem. You know, Vue or React have solved the form problem. Um, Ryan Florence recently had this tweet. Uh, I don't think there should even be form abstractions. Forms are fundamentally markup, user interaction, event handlers, state management, requests between Vue, Svelte, and React. He says React, but whatever. Um, what will a form library add, add here? Toss in some validation functions and be done with it. But still, for some reason, even when we use Vue or React, our forms end up like these giant Rube Goldberg machines that like one or two people on your team really have a fundamental understanding of how they work. They are inherently very complicated. So let's, let's look at a little history here, right? Let's start back in 1995. And then above, we've got a little chart here, the agony access. And we'll just like chart over time, like roughly how bad building forms is in history. We'll go from trivial to kill me now. So at the beginning, forms were very easy. You know, uh, when HTML first came out, you couldn't do forms. And then in uh, 1995, they added the input tags and a bunch of the other tags. And there was no JavaScript yet. So fundamentally, they were, they, you could only build a simple form. And then in 1997, we decided to, to create this thing called JavaScript. And things got a little bit harder. And, and they stayed just about that hardness for a long time. This is when I came around. There's me in 1999 writing my first website. And, and I, I call that sort of the golden age uh, of forms because it was simple for a really long time until right around 2006. Now, jQuery itself is not responsible, but it popularized Ajax, and, which is a ridiculous name if you think about it now. Uh, nobody uses XML. Um, but it, it, it popularized Ajax, and so our expectations for what these things should do, what forms should do, what websites should do, what applications should do, started to increase, and it increased dramatically all the way really until 2013 when we first see React. And in some ways, React is a solution to that complexity. Um, but in reality, if you guys have ever had to write forms in React, it's even worse. And fortunately, Vue comes along shortly after that and actually makes this a little bit better. The vModel system in Vue is a genuine improvement over the insanity that they'd have to do in the React space. Um, and so I would say life got a little bit better. At least my life got a little bit better. But that's a long time ago. We're talking about almost 10 years. And since then, we've continued to expand the ambition of what we're trying to do with the web application. And we're sort of back to this point now where form complexity is at an all-time high, our agony meter is, is off the charts, and, and we need some kind of solution. So the reality is forms are painful. There's a lot of reasons forms are painful. Um, these, are, these are the uh, sort of base nuggets of pain uh, that are in almost every single form that is at a large or organization or a large company. 
And some of these are pretty simple to understand, like boilerplate code, dear Lord, it takes a lot of just pure HTML in order to build a good form. Um, things like validation, but also like the state handling of your entire form. You know, if I have a big form, how do I know from the top of my form if there's any validation errors somewhere deep down inside my form? Um, all kinds of these problems. And these are cross-cutting concerns. There's not a single solution to any of these. But components, right? Like components are also cross-cutting and those should be a solution. And the reality is that we have a plethora of components. I mean, there are so many UI components and UI libraries and they're all great, and they all solve about that amount of the problem. Um, they just fundamentally don't solve a huge amount of the pain that goes into it. So even though we have these great UI libraries, we are still building forms in a very painful way. So what is all that other stuff? You know, if that chunk gets solved by components, what is this like larger thing? All of that junk down there. What, what domain does this belong to? I would say this is sort of a structural problem. These are, these are fundamentally structural issues in our forms. So what would a solution be to this? Well, how about we just model the data in a store, right? Maybe we'll just take the data and instead of trying to shove it into the components, we'll pull that out into a global store, maybe Pina or back in the old days, Vuex. Well, the first thing we should know is we should never say just. That's a horrible word in software engineering. So we tried this. Um, View Formulate 1 was, I don't know, 2018 or something. And we basically said, okay, components do solve some chunk of this. So let's provide some components to ourselves. And then uh, we'll, we'll take the rest of the stuff and we'll model that in Vuex. And this actually worked pretty well, except for all this stuff. This part didn't work so well. It turns out that a store doesn't model the, the form in a particularly good way. There's like, you can model maybe the data but like, how about then the errors? How about then the validation? How about your backend stuff? It just didn't model it very well. So went back to the drawing boards. Components, maybe with provide inject, so they sort of know where they are in the form or something like that. So we did this with View Formulate 2. Um, we decided, okay, let's take all of that. We'll put it under the domain of the components. And this actually worked a lot better, except for this part. So there was still something going on here. Uh, it, it turns out components don't model it particularly well. And then in 2020, something happened. And you're probably thinking the pandemic, but actually this guy made view three. And that, that entire component architecture that was sitting there in view formulate needed to get rewritten. So we went to the drawing boards and we sat around and we thought really hard about forms, which is not something fun to do, but we did it. And this was like the prevailing thought in, the, in our office, like, why the hell are these forms so hard to write? What is the problem? And we finally had an epiphany moment. And I'm going to tell you about it. Let's take an example here. Let's say we have an API. This is for updating some account, okay? It's my, my account update page. And I've got some information. It's structured. I've got a name, email, and address, which is nested, right? I've got some notification settings. The form for that might look something like this. Um, nothing particularly exciting. And yes, it does take an absurd amount of HTML to create a form like this and to do it in an accessible um, and a usable way. It's ridiculous. But components sort of solve that. So, you know, in FormKit or if you're using something else, it's going to like greatly reduce that. But that's not the important part. The important part is that it produces the exact structure that we needed in the first place. So how does it do that? Let's look at this tree. This is the component tree. We have a form. Um, we've got two components inside of it. We've got some personal details, some notification settings. And then underneath that, we've got another set of components. We've got some layout, some address. Inside of our layout, we got our like our first couple of inputs. Underneath address, we've got another couple of inputs. Our notification setting component is providing one input, which is like a checkbox to say, you know, notifications or no notifications. And then something that's like our checkbox uh, for which notifications we want. That's a list. This is the component tree. And as a reminder, this is what it's trying to produce. Now, this actually models pretty closely what's happening here, right? We've got the form, which is sort of like this outer wrapper. Then we've got an input. That's our name, our email. The address here is providing some form of grouping for the street and the city. Now we got notification settings. That's providing some sort of grouping for the things that are underneath it. We've got a list, some emails, and then some uh, index-based inputs. 
But what is this thing right here? This is, in my opinion, the fundamental problem with forms. It is why our forms are so hard to write that not everything in our component tree is in our form tree. So if you think about it, this is what that DOM, these are the DOM elements, the DOM tree that, that is represented by that form. And this is the component tree for that exact same thing. And this is the form tree. And the form tree is distinct. It's something different. Forms are their own distinct trees. And we keep trying to shove them into other ones, like shoving them into the component tree. And just like this poor little girl, what happens is we, we give up, right? And we cut corners and we skip. I mean, how many times have you been on a website, you click that button to submit, the back end sends some errors to the front end, and they just like plop it as a big blob somewhere on the screen, maybe at the bottom, maybe at the top, like, hey, here's all your errors. It's a horrible user experience. The user then has to go look at those errors and go find out which inputs they actually are on. We all know in our hearts that we were supposed to take those errors and put them on the inputs, but we didn't do it because we skipped. Forms have always been their distinct trees, always. If you think about form data, it's a really boring tree, it's a flat tree, but is distinct from the DOM. Here's the DOM elements. Those little yellow guys are the actual inputs inside of the DOM elements. And if you think about it, they look roughly like that. They end up in the form data as a flat list. It can be at any depth in your tree, doesn't matter. They're all flat. Unfortunately, the form data is very limited. If there was a great solution for this, then we should all use it. But there's a lot of problems. You can't structure the data. The keys aren't unique. You can't rehydrate your form with form data. You can't take a form like our edit form and then fill the values back in. Um, you can't, you know, transport back in errors. There's, there's uh, no communication between the inputs. There's lots of issues with this. So that's why we created FormKit. Um, we call it a form building framework, which is a really ambitious name. Um, but what's really important is that it's not a UI library. Yes, we do ship components because we want to solve sort of that pain, but you can use it with any component library. The important part is the fundamental architecture that it tries to solve. So what does it do? Well, when you type FormKit, you say FormKit type text, and then underneath it does something like this. It says create node somewhere deep inside the bowel of FormKit. And boom, a node is born. And if you do another one, type text area over here, another node is born. And you can do this on a flat structure as long as you want. But as soon as you say something like type form, it automatically knows all of the inputs that are underneath it, and it self-organizes a tree underneath the hood. And this is really important because it means you can put anything in between here. You can have an infinite level of depth between where your form is and where your inputs are, and they automatically communicate with each other. They automatically send data back and forth. You can put errors on them wherever they are. They self-organize. You can say, uh, uh, put a group underneath, and it will continue uh, to create a tree structure. You can throw some inputs underneath that. You can create something called a list, which creates an array structure, and you can put some inputs underneath that. And in between, again, you can put all the layout components you want. You can put all of the structural components you want. It doesn't matter. You're building a different tree fundamentally. So you end up with a tree that looks something like that. And it, this might look sort of weird or complicated, but actually this models a blog post perfectly. You got a title, post, some meta information, an author, published on, tags. It's a perfect model for what's happening and what, what you actually want to produce with your form. And the important thing to understand here is that in graph theory, you would call these connections edges, right? These are the connections between nodes in a graph. Those are the really, really important thing. They are able to carry more than just values. Sure, you can the values move up and down your tree, but you can also hold a validation state, your loading state, all kinds of other states, dirty, blur, whatever you need. Uh, configuration, you can push your backend errors where exactly where you want from one location. Um, you can even send plugins down through your tree and tra change the behavior of inputs uh, within a, a subset of your tree. Now, how does it work? Well, it's just a single component. So here you can see a form kit is roughly equivalent to an input. And that's kind of the goal, is to make this look as familiar as absolutely possible. Yeah, you can say type checkbox, and you get a checkbox. But we also try to smooth out some of those inconsistencies in HTML. So HTML, for some reason, in 95, they decided to create a few different inputs. Most of them are input, but there's also like select or text area, things like that. 
in FormKit, it's all just FormKit type, whatever, and everything else is handled for you. And like a good component, it sort of turbocharges what's there in the native. So you can provide, you know, a name, you can provide labels, options in the case of a checkbox, help text, all of the things that are necessary, and it's going to produce good accessible markup. And every native input is represented out of the box. You have all of these. And then we are an open source project and that doesn't make any money. So we do sell these pro inputs, which are like non-native, uh, right? But you can go use Beautify components or, or anything else if you want. This is just our take and our way of trying to sustain the open source project. Validation is right on the component. You just type it on there. You just say validation required, minimum of two. It ships with dozens of validation rules. In fact, there's a lot of features to FormKit, like way too many to spend talking about it today. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try some live coding and we'll see how it goes. Here we go. UConf US 2024. And this is a little Nuxt app. And as you can see, this is what it looks like to use FormKit. These are just, uh, you know, here's a type form and here's some inputs underneath it. And it's not a very exciting form. It's pretty boring, but it works. So if we come over here, you can see that I automatically get validation on them because they have these little validation props. But there's a lot of other inf interesting information. For example, if I come in here and I just ask for the values, you can see the default slot here on the form is destructuring value out of it. And you can do this on any input, but on the form, it's particularly interesting because you can actually see what's happening under the hood. And here you can see, as I type, it's automatically collecting all of the data for my form. And it's doing this with no V model. There's no V model structure whatsoever. There's no refs getting created or anything like that. It's just automatically flowing up through that tree that we just discussed. And there's a lot of other interesting information about it too. So for example, I could take my state, and get a whole bunch of other information about my form. And it's getting this information all the way through. So for example, here, valid is false. It automatically knows that my form is invalid. So when I try to hit the submit button, it says, nope, something down inside of there is invalid, right? And it's able to know that automatically. So whoop. if I fill this out, I think the rest of it is pretty much garbage. There, oh, there we are. Fine. <laughs> all right. And now my state is valid true. It auto automatically knew that everything inside of there was, was fulfilled. If I were to do, like delete this and become required, you can see the validation comes back. It knows um, whether or not my form's been attempted to be submitted, if it's dirty, if somebody's edited it. There's a lot of information about it that it can automatically know. So let's try to like res this up just a little bit here. Uh, how about we do like a layout double? These are just some little layout components that I wrote for our talk here. We don't want this to be an ugly form. And we'll do like a layout quad. Just adding a little bit more to our form. That looks a little better. Just some basically some flex on there. And then really down here, we should um, probably add something like payment information. And our payment information is going to be kind of annoying, right? Because we're going to need something like a credit card. Hey, there you go. What's Chad GPT or not Chad? No, I don't want to do that. All right. So I'm going to use an input um, of type mask. You guys familiar with input masks? Yeah. So we have one of those. Let's do four of those, four of those, four of those, and four of those. And now let's... There's more complexity than that, but we'll start there. And we'll say that this is your credit card number, and the help text is, nah, let's save time. All right. Okay, so we have this in here now. Great. And what else should we have? You know what? I want to have a prefix icon, and we'll make that Visa. There we go. It's looking a little better. Now, we also need the CVV. That'll be another mask. And I think those are always three. Is that right? Something like that. Sometimes. 
no icon for that one. Oh, and then a date. Yeah. The expiration date. So we'll do a date picker. And our date picker, let's see, we'll do uh, expiration date. What should the format be? I think it's usually like month, year. But it'd be kind of nice if we provided it in a, in a nicer format than that. So we'll do month, year. And um, we can actually slap an overlay on this, which lets us have multi colored masks. So this is really neat. So I can come in here and I can, I'm hitting the up down key and I'm cycling through all my months. I can start typing January and it'll auto complete all the months from my available set. Um, so that's kind of cool. Oh, but we should, we need some validation for sure. So, okay, hold on. Validation. We'll just say that this is required because I can't, this mask won't let, won't let me type anything but valid characters anyway. And then my expiration date, yeah, let's say that's required and it's a date after. By default, it'll default to today. So I don't need to even put that. So if I put in a date here that's like 1903, okay, expiration date must be in the future. And you notice that these messages are here somehow magically for free. That's because we ship all of the messages out of the box, including I18N messages. So if I look at my formkit config here, and um, I want to import, I don't know, Jarman. I'm going to import this from FormKit, I18N. And I will just provide that here under locales. I'll say that I want to be a German. And the current locale will just force it to be German. And now you can see these are all in German which, you know, cool. But there's something else. <laughs> uh, something else that's interesting. If I come back into my date picker, for example, and I remove my explicit format, this will automatically format the date in a way that's comfortable for people in Germany. And if I come back in here and I just comment this out for a second, you'll see that my format is now a different format for here in the US. So it respects their, uh, their locale automatically. You know, I don't actually want to do the rest of this in German, so take that off. Okay, so now this is starting to look a little better. Um, let's also pop on here. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, did you see this? So, so Pratik told me that next year there's going to be a couples massage with Evan Yu. If you guys want to hop into that. So you can pick any of these workshops and the couples massage, which is pretty nice. Um, but in reality, we probably want somebody to be able to buy more than one of these tickets, right? And this is like immediately where all the alarm bells in developer head should start going off. <laughs> uh, this is like, you go from one to many and it's going to, and it's going to be a problem. The other thing is like, we did this credit card information down here, which, um, you know, I'll just wrap this in a triple. There we go. Make that look a little better. Okay. We did all that, but we didn't ask for an address. Now, up here, we did ask for an address for, for the person participating. So, okay, well, what if we took all of this address information right here and we just took it out? And we'll go in our components here and we'll just create a new component. We'll call this address.view. I know we should probably not use single words, but it's okay. And I'm going to just create a little view component here. And I'm going to then bring, come over here. Hopefully, uh, Noxt will automatically autocomplete this for me. Thank you, Daniel. What am I missing? Anybody? Somebody's saying it, but I, I can't see it. Nobody? Nobody? Oh, it's because I put it at the bottom of the form. Like a genius. 
All right, here we go. Oh, that's spelled wrong. Okay. Address. Hey, there's our address. Okay. So we got our address back and it's automatically working. I don't have the values being shown, but all the values are automatically flowing from down inside of here up to the form level automatically. Um, let's just let's just show it to emphasize the point here. So here you can see my address values are flowing, even though I've just extracted that into another component. I didn't do anything else. So my code reusability is automatically off the charts. Now, I do need an address down here in my payment information. And really, the structure here should be something like maybe a group. Whoops, type group. And this is going to be, the name on this will be, I don't know, payment details. All right. And now I need to reuse my address component. So I'm going to just come in here and say, address again and now I've got my address here and my address up here and if you look these are automatically getting structured let me wrap the data in a pre-tag so you can actually see it properly so now you can see we've got um, an address down below and an address up above and they're automatically flowing into the correct places. And if I wanted to make this address uh, more structured, I could, of course, just put another group around it, call this one address. And now I've done what we were looking at on the PowerPoint. Here's my address now down below. And when I type into it, you can see it's automatically structuring itself. But if I wanted, if I wanted to order multiple tickets, you know, that's going to be a problem. So what I could do here is just come to my ticket details and say, this is going to be a repeater. Now, this is a major, major pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, but now we've just created a completely repeatable set of data. And if you take a look at what's going inside of here, it's you can see that the data here is flowing exactly where you would expect it to. Um, if I wanted to say here, I've got a, I've got a the price, <laughs> and let's see, it's down here, right? Some price. Let me just throw that inside of here, and I'll change this to be. You can put any component you want in here. So I'll just make this a layout triple. And now you see here how it's referencing value. Well, that value, if you remember, is coming from my destructure default slot. Well, this repeater, because it's part of that tree structure that we were talking about, it has its own values too. So I'm going to destructure value from here and we'll just shadow the value. And now we have the final price right here. And if you take a look, it's the final price of this repeater item, not of my entire form. And then to, we could sum it up down there, but I don't want to spend the entire time doing that. So that's a quick look at how you might use something like FormKit and how the tree structure is a fundamental solution to the problem that we've been having with forms for so long. There's one other thing I want to talk about before we all go get lunch, and that's the schema. Um, this is a really important part of building forms for larger organizations. So FormKit schema is a JSON serializable data format for storing DOM structure and component implementations, including FormKit forms. This is not unique to FormKit. You could use this to render literally anything. Um, it, re it compiles to render functions. So let's look at it. Okay, let's say we want to represent, sorry about the red. Uh, I tried to get all the color out of there, but um, like we got a little div up here with hello world inside of it. We can represent this in a JSON serializable format like this, right? Dollar sign EL div, and then the children is hello world. That then, when you pass it into the FormKit schema component, renders a div, hello world. Not that exciting. Why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because you can do stuff with that format. 
You could store it in a database. You can send it over a wire. You can assemble it with a form builder. You can do whatever you want with it very, very easily. And on the outside, you can produce the initial result. Imagine a form builder that generates the schema and then you ship it to a client front end and it automatically builds your schema. So here um, is the three things that you can represent. You can represent DOM elements with a dollar sign EL. You can represent components with a dollar sign CMP. And a shorthand for the dollar sign CMP for form kit is dollar sign form kit. But what makes it really powerful is the fact that it supports expressions. It supports Boolean logic, arithmetic, function calls, conditional rendering, slot rendering, and lots of other things. And I will show you a very quick demo of that. So let's make this bigger for everybody. This is the FormKit playground where you can go play around. Um, so here I have a, a, a simple schema, right? It's just a FormKit type form, and then it's got a child, which is one number. Now you remember how we destructured value out of the form originally? This is happening automatically in the schema. And so I can just add here, uh, value and it's you know not going to jsonify it for me but you can see it's referencing something so let me get the value dot uh quantity okay and now this is actually a fully reactive expression and we're reading from that now, i know what you're thinking is this eval no it's not eval there's a tiny lightweight runtime compiler that builds this into uh into render functions so I can, I can do other things here. It's not JavaScript, but I can do things like this. I can multiply this. And now I'm actually doing arithmetic in JSON. So here you can see I'm providing something to my FormKit schema. Here's my FormKit schema. It's taking that little blob that we just looked at. This even bigger. And here's a data object that's getting passed in. And my data object actually has a function. It's got this function, international number format, and it's just passing in dollars here. Uh, but like maybe we want to pass in a price too, because we're getting that from some API or something. So there's our $2.33. So instead of multiplying it by that, we'll just multiply it by dollar sign price. And that's how you reference information from that data object. And now you can see it's still working. And now we're reading two items out of there. But I can also say I want to what is it? Dollars. I want to format this as dollars and you call this pretty much like you would. And now we have something rendering with actual formatting on it. So that is a very brief look at the form kit schema. Um, it's an incredibly powerful tool and really useful. That is it for me. Um, formkit.com is where you see these docs. That's my Twitter handle. If uh, you care to hear me talk about forms occasionally and uh, use form kit is the, is the, um, a form kit Twitter handle. So that's it. If you have any questions, come ask me after.